A big thank you to all of my listeners. And if you would like to support this transmission even more and boost your trading account, go to trendfollowing.com slash now. And without any further delay, on to today's show. This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is David Burkus. His new book, titled Under New Management, will make anybody that dreams of being on the assembly line, doing repetitive motion, 10 hours a day, not happy. David will force you to think this is not the day and age where we should aspire or we should have our children aspire to repetitive motion tasks as a way to live a life. That is just not the direction in 2016. I hope you enjoy this conversation with David Burkus. I want to jump into the notion of work, the workplace, and the real starting point of that, and you throw a name out there in the beginning of your newest work that I've not heard from a long time, I don't know if I wanted to hear that name again, but I think it's useful for us as we start to examine the workplace. Frederick Winslow Taylor. Give my audience, give my audience the education they need to know about that name, and then we will forget about that name very quickly. <laughs> ah, Freddie Taylor. You can't you can't forget about Freddie. Freddie, I mean, so here's the thing. Freddie Taylor discovered something really truly revolutionary, which was that, and actually I write about this at the end of my book, that it's not necessarily about innovating the product. It's about innovating the factory and what that looked like for him, because he was, he was working as a consultant in the industrial era. What that looked like for him was maximizing the factory to be incredibly efficient. So he looked at the production process that you needed for a given factory, a given industrial work organization. And then he looked at what it took to create that product most efficiently. And he boiled that down. He brought in his trusty stopwatch and he actually timed for, you know, optimal motions. And he would, the, the funniest thing is he would weigh certain things for optimal sort of weight. So for example, he discovered for one client that 21 and a half pounds of coal was the optimal amount of coal to be shoveling into a furnace. Not really knowledge you and I ever need to know, but just in case you ever wondered, 21 and a half pounds, any, any more than that, and you would burn out before the end of an eight hour shift and any less than that, and you weren't being peak efficient. And what I think is interesting about that is he, the, the factory wasn't using shovels that could go 21 and a half pounds. So he had a new one created. He basically designed a new shovel. That was how serious he was about optimizing every motion of production. The downside of all his work is that he truly believed that it was management's job to in engage in what he called scientific management, all of this experimentation and optimization, and that labor's job was just to take orders, right? So in, es in essence, workers were dumb, managers were all-knowing, and workers just needed to listen to managers. And then one thing that he actually did that was really well-meaning is he believed that if you could incentivize for these optimal things, that people would make more money and that labor would benefit from essentially admitting that they were dumb. And we have to give the man a little bit of credit because under scientific management, we had a huge boom in industrial work. The, the market just went crazy. A lot of, a lot of growth in the industry for a long period of time. And really, if it weren't for Frederick Taylor, we wouldn't have gotten the, in the United States, at least, we wouldn't have gotten the business of work built to such a place that we could shift from industrial work to knowledge work. And that's actually why we need to forget Frederick Taylor's name is that we've made that shift. We've moved from uh, a physical factory to an idea factory. Most of us don't shovel 21 and a half pounds of coal anymore. And at this point, we drug a lot of Frederick Taylor's ideas with us into the office. You know, we took it from the factory, we moved it to the office, and it's just not working. And that's the challenge. It's not that 
his goals weren't ideal. It's just that we need to focus on reinventing the factory. This time, the factory is an idea factory, and those old policies won't work. You're kind of a side tangent. If you look at the rest of the world, the likes of uh, China or Vietnam or Myanmar or in Indonesia, they are right in the middle of these types of things. I mean, you look at these, you know, the horror stories in the news, the Apple factories and the, uh, the suicide nets, that type of thinking, that optimal thinking, basically using people as robots. Uh, it's still, it's still going on. It just left America and went to other countries for the time being. Oh, totally. Uh, you know, absolutely. There, there are, you know, it's interesting. There are other countries that are sort of still benefiting. There was a, there was an anecdote I found that when Frederick Taylor's grandson who, uh, as far as I know, is actually still alive, right? So Frederick Taylor's ideas were about 100 years old. His grandson would still be alive. He, re he recorded going to Japan, you know, during, I think it was around, I, I don't quote me on this as exactly, but, uh, or if it's wrong, don't hold it against me, but around the 1980s, and he went to Japan, and he found people bowing deeply low to him. still a huge amount of respect in those, in those countries for Frederick Taylor and for ideas, because they, they can teach you how to run a factory. Now, they can't teach you how to run a factory and have employees who feel good about themselves, have good work-life balance, whose families are proud of what they do, right? But they can teach you how to focus on what it takes to produce a physical product, produce it, and then it, they can tell you how to adjust people in order to create that product most efficiently. The challenge is most of us now, for most organizations, the product comes between the two ears of the people. And so when you shift from uh, industrial work to knowledge work, you need to redesign your office, your factory around people, not around that product. And you need to figure out what the people need to be sustainable or what one friend of mine calls prolific, health, healthy, and brilliant all at the same time. Before we get into your newest work under new management, I want to add one more thought to this Freddie Taylor thought process, the rest of the world. And, and not necessarily looking for a political opinion from you, but it is interesting that you've got this very progressive thinking in your newest work. I read it and I go, wow, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. You go the whole book and you're just like, okay, this all makes perfect sense. I might not have thought of that way, but it makes perfect sense. What's really interesting in America right now is there's actually two political candidates, one on the right and one on the left, that are both clamoring for all of these jobs that we're, I wouldn't say we're making fun of them, but we're kind of saying it's a tough way to live. It's, it's not really where we're going to be in the future, but a significant portion of Americans are not really open to where you're going here in your newest work. They still want those positions that went to the China and Vietnam and Indonesia, et cetera. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I I would argue that even the type of industrial work that we do in the United States now still requires a lot of creativity and innovation. It still requires a decent amount of problem solving, idea generation. You know, it's not just running running a drill on a line 800 times a, a day, etc. And a lot of manufacturing has shifted to a bit of more of a team focus. So even even those jobs, I mean, granted, they, they are rooted in Frederick Taylor's ideas, they're rooted in the industrial era, but even the nature of those jobs have changed. And that was one of the things I found in Under New Management is there are companies like uh, Steel, Steelscape comes to mind, for example, or the GE Durham plant that builds um, aircraft engines for, for GE. They still work in a much more knowledge work way than an industrial work way. Uh, and those are, truthfully, I believe those are the jobs that we probably ought to be shifting to even in industrial work in our country because those are the jobs that are a lot harder to train a robot to do or a lot harder to sort of ship overseas because they take so much tacit knowledge. So so you're right. I think it's kind of weird to be clamoring for those jobs. And, and you know, Daniel Pink warned about this almost over a decade ago with A Whole New Mind that every everything that can be uh, taught to a machine or outsourced is going to be outsourced or taught to a machine. But there is industrial work that still requires that. And that's what we ought to be pushing people who want to stay in that life, too. And I think there are benefits to that, too, because, you know, we, we do need knowledge in all of those areas. I don't I don't want to throw people under the bus in that regard, but we do need knowledge in those areas. And when we do that and when we redesign the factory to take advantage of that, I think even we'll see growth even there. The real issue, though, your newest work, the real issue comes down to the physical labor leading to the mental labor. It's the creative firms today versus the industrial firms. Big picture, let the audience come into your world, all the research that you've done, and start to paint the picture about where, and it's, look, we, we have to generalize here. There's so many different types of companies. 
Talk about this shift. And I, for me personally, I might, you know, I kind of grew up in the mid 1990s and my late 20s, and I saw everything happen with the dot com revolution. The creative firm is here to stay. And there's a, uh, there's a, and your work is all about this. There's a new way of thinking, there's a new direction for creative work. It's not the Frederick Taylor way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. So, like I, like I alluded to earlier, most most people, if you work in an office, you you do what I would call creative work. My I hope my first book, The Mystery of Creativity, was about that. That creativity is everyone's business because all of us are tasked with coming up with ideas, tasked with making decisions or solving problems. All of which taps into that creative uh, nature, right? So all of us are required to do that. And it turns out, as I like to say, that uh, it turns out that most of us in the United States work in a way that the product is made as a result of either our decisions or the collective decisions of our team, right? We don't, we may m still make physical products, you know, to use, um, to use Apple, for example, right? A Apple definitely, like you said earlier, outsources the work of producing that product somewhere, but the work of designing that product still happens here. And when you're doing that type of work, you really can't bring Frederick Taylor with you to that type of factory. Right. And that's the mistake that we've made for a really long time. That's why our, our morale rates are really low. Our engagement rates are really low. That's why we don't have restaurants called TGI Mondays, right? It's TGI Fridays because we've brought that mentality with us and it's not serving us. It's, it, I mean, again, you can walk into any TGI Fridays and see that it's not serving us, right? Because of the mere name. So the, the challenge that we have before us now is to think like Frederick, Frederick Taylor and think like, how do we create a new idea factory, how do we manage people in order to optimize for that type of production? And what I highlight in Under New Management are a bunch of different entrepreneurial and corporate leaders who are making those experiments. And then, interestingly enough, a bunch of different organizational researchers who are also doing experiments, and these things tend to be aligned. So it's not just that these are like crazy ideas that work. These are crazy ideas that are super counterintuitive to a Frederick Taylor world, but also have a ton of psychological data behind why they work so well. Big picture from my perspective, going through your work, and I made this note to myself, I said, isn't this all about trying to make big companies with lots of employees and letting those employees feel, appear, act as either individual or small groups of entrepreneurs? It seems like that's essentially what some of the issues I'm going to questions and bring up with you. It seems that's really what's going on here is, is getting everyone to feel, act, and think like an entrepreneur. You know, I, I talk to a lot of leaders at, at bigger organizations, and they, they often do talk about that idea of, you know, oh, we want to have that startup feel, we want to have that strong culture feel. And I think, I mean, I think you might be on to something. I, I have met a lot of startups that sort of struggle and have a micromanaging founder and kind of become crazy, too. I think it just so happens that a lot of those companies, when they're smaller, can experiment with these different ideas. And so it's easier to take that experiment and pivot. If you roll out a, a change to a 10,000 person organization, it's a whole lot harder to do than if you have 10 people in your organization. I, you see a lot of these startups, particularly in the tech industry, because of the constant sort of experimentation, the idea of agile programming, I think extends into agile management. You, you have a lot of these startups that are, that are leading the way on that. I do think it's possible to get a 10,000 person organization to feel like a, a, a startup, even when it's not. And it comes down to, again, how do we treat our people? You're definitely right. I, I also think what's going on there is that in order to do this creative work, we need to give a lot of uh, autonomy to the people who are the knowledge experts in the field. You know, we, we're in a really interesting era where it's possible for you as an individual contributor to know more about your role than your manager does. And when that happens, we really do need to give you a lot of autonomy and think and treat, treat you to think like a solopreneur because you really are. You may be the only person in the organization that knows as much about that thing as you do. And so we need to trust you a lot more. The only funny thing about this conversation is I don't believe you or I have a manager. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I moonlight as an academic, right? I'm a recovering academic. And so I do have a dean. But, you know, oh, one yeah. of the interesting things about a university life is faculty sort of say, like, you know, we don't work for the university. We are the universities. You know, if you, if, you, if you take all the faculty members off of a residential university, you have a really expensive hotel. <laughs> so, you know, yes, I, d I definitely think I've had and I've had deans in the past who think that they're my manager, right? And then I also, you know, I spent five years in the pharmaceutical industry before going back to graduate school. So I've had one and I've had a good ones and I've had bad ones. But you're right. I, I'm, for, I'm fortunate in that I don't have one now. 
my questions are all coming from the perspective. I'm the, I'm the curious outsider who, who doesn't know what these manager things are. But I, I, I know a lot of my listeners, you know, this is part of their world and their life. And I'm really curious. And I, I want to dig into some of these issues that you bring up, some of these counterintuitive issues, ideas, concepts throughout your work. And, you know, like, right when I jump in, I, it was great when it started. But my gosh, how much usefulness is still in email today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you remember when you were excited when the thing would be, you've got mail and it was super exciting because one of your six friends thought to email you, you know, I mean, one of your six friends who had email, do you remember those days? It was so awesome. I mean, things have changed. I mean, we've email is just one aspect of this. It's, I think your issue gets more at distraction and how does one manage digital distraction, whether it's coming in forms of email or text messages or Facebook or Twitter. I mean, it's all kind of the same thing. There's too much of it all. Totally right on. And, and e email is a great example because email has two huge strengths, right? Email is cheap and it's asynchronous. Right. So it costs almost nothing to send. Right. If you're a large organization, it costs a decent amount to get everything set up. Right. But the the actual cost of one email is, is dramatically less than a postage stamp for sure. Right. So it's cheap. But it's also uh, the other benefit is it's asynchronous, meaning you can send it. And it's not like a face to face conversation where you're asking for someone to turn off everything they're doing and look at you. Right. The problem is we don't treat it like it's asynchronous. I think this might even be a human thing. We're just really bad at thinking about communication as, as asynchronous, right? We, I mean, maybe we get a physical letter and we realize that we can't respond right away. But at email, it feels like when we get that notification, we're supposed to respond. And then, I mean, how many of us are guilty of this? I, I wrote this chapter and I'm still guilty of this. We send off an email and we don't get a reply inside of like six seconds. And we're, we're constantly checking our email box until we get a reply. Right. And the, the more important we determine it is, not the receiver, the more important we as the email sender determine it is, the quicker we want a response. And inside of a work context, that's a recipe for disaster. You know, one of the things that we know about creative work is that there are times where distraction is a good thing and there are times where it requires deep focus, right? Where we need to shut off all distractions. And the default settings on Microsoft Outlook and Mac Mail and all of these other email programs are not created to leave us alone. They're created to notify us. They're I mean, they're called notifications. They might as well be called distractifications, right? Because that's what their, their job is to do. I'm amazed at how many people I encounter that don't understand this idea of distraction. Maybe they've not had a chance to experience this deep focus that you just mentioned, but I'm amazed at how many people just don't get deep focus. And, and you, your best work, your most creative work comes from uninterrupted concentration. And, and if you're constantly having to break the train of thought, look, there's that old, that old little wives tale. I don't think it's wives tale that if you basically have one thought and you're in room A and you walk through the door, the sheer act of walking through the door by the team you get to room B, usually you forget what you're thinking about in room A. And this is kind of what constant text and emails are all about. And I think that you're, you're, it's not necessarily surprising to say this, but you're really onto something about the, the focus part of why a lot of this really just needs to stop. Yeah, totally. I mean, replace replace room A and room B with window A and window B on a computer, and, and you're exactly right. This hmm. is what's going on, right? We switch, we toggle back and forth, and and you know, we, we believe in this myth of multitasking, right? But there is, I mean, cognitive scientists will tell you there's no such thing as multitasking. There is only task switching, right? And some of us are good at that. And there are even some things that lend themselves to task switching, meaning we can switch back and forth between tasks. But when it comes to that sort of deep creative work of ideation, it's it, we lose a lot when we switch every time. And some studies say it can take up to 15 minutes to get back to where we were when we're distracted. Think about the average settings on an Outlook that come by default. They're checked for email every five minutes. Right. So some of us might go through our entire day and all we did that day was clear out our email inbox thinking we moved the ball down the field, but we really didn't. Right. All we did is clear our uh, inbox. Right. And we, I mean, I know some people that actually treat their inbox as a to-do list. And so they really do feel like they <laughs> check things me. off their to-do list. 
Yeah, but <laughs> but you know, I mean, but I'll be honest. Did did you move the ball down the field? Right. I mean, like for running a podcast, yes, responding to email is important. But what we're doing right now, recording it, far more important. Right. right so right, right. if all you're doing is replying to those, it's a lot harder. And what we see inside an organizational context is is this distraction has a huge cost. And so there are lots of companies that are moving to totally outlawing email. And that can take a couple different forms. There are some companies like Atos that decided they're going to be a zero email company. They switched to an internal system that interrupts people less and allows for uh, better communication, which is, I, I know people say, like, aren't you just moving from one technology to the other? Yes, but we took a deep look at what are the communication needs of our company before we decided on a tool, which that alone is a revolutionary concept, right? Look at your own needs before you pick out a, a tool instead of pick a tool and then have it disrupt your needs. And then there are other companies that realize, you know, people don't actually know or don't actually use uh, their away from work settings enough and all of those sort of things. We, we tend to just stick with the defaults that come with the program. And so they would shut off their email servers at a certain time. So from 6 p.m., let's say, to 8 in the morning, you could still, if you were that type of person that loved to work, you know, at night. And so you're sending emails at 11 o'clock. That's awesome. You can clear out your email, email inbox. They just won't arrive in anyone else's inbox until 8 a.m. the next morning when we turn the server back on. I want to offer something about email and professors, my experience. It is one of the easiest things to do on the planet is to locate a professor's email. And honestly, the response, and maybe this is because I'm writing for an interview request or whatnot, but I really think professors are, my experience in the last four or five years, boy, on time response. I'm telling you what, you can find a professor's email anywhere in the world fast, and they generally respond. That's a side note. I don't even want you to go there. You know what I'm talking about. You're easy to find right now, too, if I wanted to find your email on your on your academic website, I'm sure. Oh, totally, totally. And and I get a lot of junk mail because of that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> another, another counterintuitive point you make in your newest work. I really like this, and I want you to expand on it, perhaps using an example. One of the examples that you use is Wegmans, but I want to quote you here first. You're talking about the idea of the customer coming second and employees first. And what you say... Simply put, profits are driven by customer loyalty, customer loyalty is driven by employee satisfaction, and employee satisfaction is driven by putting employees first. Now, that might seem normal or intuitive, but it's really not. Oh, totally, right? We live in a, we, we live in a customer is always right world, right? And actually, the, just the other day, I was speaking to a bunch of wealth management and investment advisors. And I, I felt like, hey, this is the perfect example of a place where the customer can't always be right, right? How many of you have ever dealt with a client who wants to do a certain thing and you say, no, that's financial suicide. You can't do that. The customer's not always right. That's the start. But the truth is that customer satisfaction is a result, right? Customer satisfaction is, if we think about cause and effect, it's not a cause, it's an effect. And the cause is, is putting employees first, letting employees know you have your back. I, I know countless people who were trying to serve a, an angry client and who, when management came over, basically threw the employee under the bus in order to save that one client's relationship. And imagine what that does to that employee's morale. Right? It just ruins the whole thing. And so that employee doesn't feel like they can put the customer first anymore. That employee feels like the organization doesn't even have their back. There's a divided loyalty. What would have been the better way to handle that example you just gave, though? So my favorite example of all time is Herb Kelleher of Southwest Airlines. There was a customer that constantly flew uh, Southwest Airlines and constantly complained about the flight attendant, about the gate agent, about all sorts of things. And, and after the 20th time that she would be attacking these employees, Herb, the CEO of the airline, mind you, wrote her a letter and said, you know what, ma'am? We don't want you to ever fly our airline again. We're not right for what you want. And so there's this idea, right, that, yeah, we want to have outstanding customer satisfaction. But in order to do that, you have to put employees first. And, and honestly, the other thing you need to do to do that is you have to be willing to say to some customers, our product, our service, it's not for you. Right. We tailor made it for this type of client and you're dissatisfied because you're not that type of client. Right. I mean, I, I'm reminded of there are lots of different uh, restaurants and, and especially sort of if you think about this is actually a great example that I just now thought of. If you think about Chipotle, the first time you walked into a Chipotle, you were super confused. Right. And thankfully, they were nice enough to sort of explain it. Right. But you're super confused until you learn how their new system works. Right. The same thing with the Starbucks. Starbucks actually trains its employees to no matter what you order, it will restate back what the Starbucks name for that product is trying to train you to be a better customer, 
But you have to be willing to have some people say, you know what, we're, we're not for you. We're not that type of place. And in the case of Starbucks, it actually turns out to be like the coffee connoisseurs are the ones who aren't there. But the everyday people, that's what they're made for. So you have to be willing in supporting your people to also say that it's not for a certain customer base. And, and hopefully you've done your market research and the customer base that you're for is big enough to sustain your, your organization. Those are really the two key things to creating that sort of loyal customer satisfaction. It begins with putting employees first so that they can put uh, the customers first. But you have to be willing when those customers who aren't right for your organization are having a problem with your employee, you have to be willing to have their back. I got one. You know, the Kelleher example is fantastic. I got one the other day. Somebody, I don't know what they were ranting and raving about and wanted to be a customer and, I don't know, basically calling me the son of Satan or something. I don't know what. And I basically just said, please go away, best Mike. I did, <laughs> just like that was all I had, you know, please go away. I don't, I don't want whatever you're trying to give me. I don't want your money. Go away. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I, I, mean, I do it, I, the same thing that happens to me as an author, right? So I have a, a list of people that subscribe to my podcast and get other updates via email. And, and we're in the midst of sort of book launch season. And every time I send an email about my book, I get two or three emails back, you know, mind you out of like 12,000, I get you two, two or three emails back that say, how dare you promote your product, blah, 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 blah. And, and I just write back like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I assumed that since I've been sending you two years of free content, you'd be willing to hear a little bit about the way that I eat. But my mistake, this is probably not good for you. I've gone ahead and unsubscribed you, right? Before they even sort of say unsubscribe me, I said, you know what? This, this isn't right for you. So, sorry. Okay, another great counterintuitive thought precept that is occurring in companies today, progressive companies and look, we're just going to cover a few of these. We can't cover all these. People are going to have to go read the read under new management how leading organizations are up ending business as usual. <laughs> one of the issues I want to bring up, another one of these counterintuitive issues, Zappos. Uh, this is uh, is this is it? Hey, is it Tony Shea? Is it pronounced Tony Shea? Yeah. Tell me the at some point in the first few. I've never heard of this until I read your book. At some point in the first few weeks of being hired on at Zappos. The online shoe retailer that has, uh, they probably expanded beyond shoes by now. I haven't checked, but you know, they've got every shoe under the sun. You get an offer in the first few weeks of employment. Tell us about that wonderful offer you get at Zappos and the logic behind it. Well, you don't get an offer, you get the offer, capital T, capital O. That's what they know it as. In, in essence, what they say is, hey, you, you just got done with primary training. Usually you actually handle the customer service call because that's what they pride themselves on. And, and you understand what our culture is like. If you don't believe this is for you, we'll pay you to leave right now. And, and if you look at it, it's, it's about four, last time I checked it, it was $4,000, right? Which is about the monthly salary of the call center employee that they're looking to, to hire $4,000. So we'll essentially say, you know, we'll give you a month's severance if you leave right now. We'll help you find, you know, we'll give you money to survive while you find a new place. Because if this isn't for you, we'd rather learn this now than learn it six months from now when we've invested even more in you. And this is actually a brilliant idea for two reasons. The first is actually what, what you just said. It's, it's definitely more costly to, to cut ties early than it is to invest a ton in training an employee. You know, by, by some measures, a company will spend one and a half times the salary in the first year. Uh, just training somebody. So the salary plus one and a half times the salary, training them, getting them up to speed before they're really sort of creating value back for the organization. And so Zappos says, well, we'd rather, you know, we'd rather spend $4,000 on that now than, you know, one and a half times your salary over the next year to find out you're not a fit. The other reason that this works so brilliantly is that most people don't take the offer, right? Anywhere between four and 8% of people in a year sort of take the offer, right? So 90 plus percent of people take, don't take the offer. They decide to stay. And there's a really interesting, you know, sort of cognitive trait that we humans all have. It's a, it's a psychological bias called confirmation bias. Essentially, we selectively filter in or filter out information that confirms to our worldview. And I think it's really fascinating in the case of we make a decision and then we look for, even after we've made the decisions, we look for things that will confirm why we made the right decision. So imagine now I'm offering you a month's salary to quit. You choose not to quit. You might not even be aware of it, but now you're suddenly looking for, oh yeah, this must be a place, great place to work. And I really love this. And, and why would I leave? Because, you know, it's, it's a terrible idea to leave now when I could have left then. So now I'm even more engaged. I'm actively looking for reasons to be engaged. And this, I think, is interesting because you see an increase in, in engagement, but you didn't, actually, you didn't actually have to spend any money on those 90% of people. It makes even more sense when people don't take the offer. 
again, the counterintuitive aspect of it. Let me jump around a little on you. The open office versus the closed office. Let me pass along an example. Let me let you comment, dig it apart. I was at Bloomberg's headquarters in New York City in December. I'd been there years back, uh, but I get there and I'm, I quickly see and remember this big open environment. Uh, you know, everyone's, uh, you know, there's, there's free food, free candy, you know, the sales staff is all in a big open environment. I didn't really see many closed offices. Maybe there are some there. Bloomberg is extremely successful as a company. Who am I to question? There is some interesting research about these, uh, these open environments versus closed environments. I, I started to, as I was reading your work, I started to think about personality differences too, introversion versus extroversion. And of course, the issue of distraction and focus also come into play again. Why don't you open up for the audience some of what you learned in your research about the, what's where we are today in terms of percentages of these, quote, open offices, maybe even describe what an open office is, and closed offices is the more private way that would have been the traditional office environment we, we might have thought about decades ago. There is definitely a trend towards open offices, and it's, it's a really interesting thing. Two, two things kind of merged, right, to create this trend. The first was this realization that it's, it's far more cost efficient. So when you have an open office, meaning sort of everybody's office is out in the open, there's, there's not walls per se, except for conference rooms, et cetera. Everybody can kind of see everybody. Sometimes there are just long tables and you have a spot at the table. Sometimes there are assigned desks. Uh, and then there are other companies where you just sort of roam. In an open office environment, the idea is that it makes collaboration easier. It makes serendipity easier, right? Meaning you might just happen to be talking to somebody from a different department and they give you an idea that helps your idea. The other thing that happened in this trend is there started to be a lot of research that this is a, you know, this is a good idea for those serendipitous discussions, right? That, op that open offices create that sort of collaboration environment. They create an environment where people who normally don't see each other see each other more often, and that can be a good thing. The challenge is we're sort of using that research. Truth, I, I believe we're using that research in order to sort of hide the fact that what we're really in it for is that we save a ton of money. The thing that we're ignoring is there's a ton of research supporting the idea that open offices do come at other costs, right? Those costs are not financial. It's a lot cheaper, but those costs uh, come from things like increased stress levels. We're just, we're not trained to sort of be always on as a species. We need some time to hide and do that kind of deep work that we were talking about earlier. There's also research that says that people are more likely to, to take sick days in an open office environment. So they might not actually be sick. They might just be sick of their office, but they're more likely to call in sick. Even, you know, increased stress levels, distraction, increased sick days. There's a ton of research on there are negative effects to productivity in an open office. And I believe that those costs outweigh whatever benefits there are for an open office floor plan. And what I actually advocate for in under new management does sort of hit at that personality research that you alluded to. It's this idea that we're all sort of different and the best offices aren't open or closed. The best offices have the, the best term I've heard to describe this is they have a palette of places, meaning they have a variety of different places where employees can work and you can move around depending on the needs of yourself and also the needs of the type of work that you're doing, right? Which I think is a revolutionary concept, right? So some of these offices will have long tables of open places. They'll have offices, closed offices you can, you can sort of reserve that are just you. They'll have conference rooms. A lot of them, if they're a bigger organization, might even have kind of a cafe area. And so you could, you could meet in, meet in one employee for, for coffee at nine in the morning and discuss something and then go hide and do that deep work and then go do lunch in a big open table with a bunch of other people, depending on those sort of needs. And I think this is really useful because, you know, like you said, introversion versus extroversion. The, the truth is what a lot of people don't realize is introversion and extroversion in psychological measures is a sliding scale. Right? It's not really a categorization. You're not an introvert or an extrovert. Most of us are somewhere towards the middle, but leaning one way or the other. Right, which actually means that there are times where we love to sort of be alone and there are times where we love being around people. And, and to be sort of what, again, what a friend of mine calls prolific, healthy and brilliant, we need to understand what we need to do our work. That's a very individual thing. Right? And so only by creating these sort of pallets of places do we provide employees the opportunity to learn about themselves and adjust where they work accordingly. The non-compete non environment you go into the example comparing Silicon Valley 
to Boston's tech quarter, making a comparison, growth in one area, not growth in another area. Why don't you talk about the non, non-compete? Because look, you know, if you're a software guy, if you're a financial guy, I mean, there's things where you think, this is my, this is my golden goose, this code or these rules. And, uh, you know, I've got to, any whoever comes into the office is going to sign their life away if they want to be so... Uh, uh, so lucky to to see the behind the curtain of Oz that they, they, they'll never be able to use this information against me to compete. Uh, this type this type of thinking has not worked out so well, has it? No, no, it hasn't. And and you know, what you were referring to with Silicon Valley versus uh, Route 128 in Boston. If you look at the history of the tech industry, the tech sector, both of those places had, in terms of raw resources, had pretty much equal footing, you know. So Silicon Valley was uh, close to a university, a major university with a technology sector at Stanford. Uh, Route 128 in Boston was close to MIT. So both had this constant flux of new ideas, but also new talent. The interesting thing is, in California, they had a little a little rule on the books that has been there for a long time that essentially invalidates any non-compete clause you would sign. So the non-compete clause, again, is this idea that you sign a thing that says if you come to work here and then you leave, you agree not to work for a competitive firm for uh, X number of years. Usually it's one to three years, but it can be sort of longer. And California says, you know, that restricts the freedom of Californians to work and therefore it's invalid. So what you had in Silicon Valley, and there's there's a lot more to that sort of um, California culture as opposed to the, the Boston culture that created kind of a culture of openness and sharing, but you had a constant rotating of talent, of ideas. You had a willingness of people to share knowledge that they had attained with other people who may one day be competitors, may not. And because of that sharing, you had a lot more ideation. You had a lot more benefits from people collaborating. And you had essentially that the, we, we very rarely talk about Silicon Route 128, right? It still, it still has done amazing things. But what you saw was a huge growth in the, the Silicon Valley sector and then a, a decline in that area. I mean, I actually, I went growing up, I went to church in the shadow of the Wang building. Not a lot of people remember Wang Technologies. It was this giant building in Lowell, Massachusetts that was basically vacant every time I saw it because they had lost. And, I, you know, I believe in there are other sociologists and other, other historians that kind of believe that one of the contributing factors to that was the culture in that area. It was very siloed, very tight-lipped. If you left... You basically weren't allowed to talk about it. You weren't allowed to work for a competitor. And the challenge is, as you know, this chapter comes from uh, a lot of it is, is borrowed from the research of um, a brilliant law scholar named Orly Lobel, who wrote a book called Talent Wants to Be Free. And that's really what it's about. Talent actually wants to be free. So you're having a harder time retaining good talent because they, they want that sort of mobility. They want the ability to use the talent that they have to get a good deal for them. And that might mean moving to a different firm. That might mean moving to a totally different region. It might mean a lot of different things. There's research both in the lab and outside of it that that people, when they have a non-compete uh, condition, work less. My little bit that I understand, we, we've already used the example, but it's a great it's a great classic example, which is Apple, who's got more cash than anybody in the bank right now. And my understanding is, is that Johnny Ivy's design team is a very small, close-knit group. It's not what they're doing in that close-knit group is not accessible by the vast majority of people that work for Apple. How does the non-non-compete work, though, exactly? Because, I mean, there are things that, wh where do you draw these lines? I, I mean, look, we could probably talk for hours and hours and hours about this, but I want, I want the audience to understand a little bit more about the logic behind non-competes because there are proprietary things that companies will want to protect or they they think they want to protect or am i completely missing the understanding of this counterintuitive principle that you are outlining well so there's a difference between a non-compete and a non-disclosure and a, a non-compete is actually putting uh, restrictions on somebody's ability to use the free market to move around and work at different places that said you know a apple's an interesting example i think they're sort of the they're the, the exception that proves the rule in a lot of cases. Because, you know, for, for every Apple, there's also a Google that is notoriously open, notoriously fostering collaboration, all of those sort of things. So, honestly, I'm not entirely sure what's going on with Apple that allows them to sort of buck that trend. But overall, what we see is that places that 
are for the free movement of, of information. And that may just be inside the organization and you don't do much of it outside of it with a non like with the non-disclosure. But the idea of a non-compete, and keep in mind, both Apple and Google are based in California where non-compete clauses are totally invalidated. So that all of their employees in California have freedom to move around. What we see are huge benefits to that collaboration and that idea. And what we see with a lot of companies now, this is sort of a, a term that I coined because I didn't know what else to call it, was the non-non-compete environment, which is literally bringing people in for short stints of time, knowing that they're going to learn some about us, but trusting that what we're going to learn about them will be more beneficial. And one really interesting area in engineering, you see this, there was one study that showed that it, you would think, right, the reason you want a non-compete clause is that if I work for you and then I leave and I go work somewhere else, I'm taking all the knowledge I gained while working for you and I'm bringing it with me to that organization. And that's why we want to put a non-compete on. We want to make it harder for you to take our knowledge and bring it to that other organization. But it turns out that when I create that network tie between your company and this new company I went to, that the information travels both ways. So looking at patents as a way to sort of measure where knowledge is coming from, because every patent has to cite the patents that influenced it. We see that when, per when people migrate from one firm to another, the amount that that firm cites each other increases. So it's not just me taking information to the competitor, because I still have connections to your old firm, if those connections are, are allowed, right? Because I still have those connections, I'm also sending information that I'm gaining at this new firm back, and your firm still sort of benefits, right? Now, obviously, there are limits on that, right? If I'm just taking, taking, taking and never giving, it's probably a bad deal. But the trust that goes on in these non-non-competes environment is that it's sort of a good deal for everybody. And again, there's a difference between non-compete and non-disclosure. So there's a difference on what information can kind of be shared. Right? But I think it's telling that really one of the primary drivers of our ability to sort of solve problems is our ability to connect with people. And a non-compete clause that basically says you can only try and use people inside your firm and you can't leave, et cetera, to solve a problem, it's it's not really in our best long-term interest. Sure, it's in our best short-term, but it's not really in our best long-term. And then the other interesting thing is that at a societal level, you see that it's panning out. When when Michigan essentially had a, a, had a court decision that invalidated non-competes, I, be, I believe, it's been, it's been a while since I've looked into the specifics of this in my own book. I feel bad saying that. But then they had a new law that was passed that allowed non-competes to happen. We saw a huge dearth of talent leave the state of Michigan, right? And that didn't, obviously, I don't want to attribute everything that happened to Michigan to that one thing, but we did actually see a huge migration of highly skilled knowledge workers going to other states. So we think that non-competes are good for companies. They're not. We think that non-competes are good for state and local economies. They're not. They're just, they're not a good deal. David? Good chatting today. The book is Under New Management, How Leading Organizations Are Upending Business as Usual. Definitely some really, as I've, I've said it multiple times today, very counterintuitive. And we've only scratched the surface. Some of the things that I really thought were cool, too, was the, the notion of burnout. I just finished a four-day trip to Myanmar. I have to say, you, you come back refreshed, that people will have to go read and check out some of these, these other ideas, but uh, really, a really good, thoughtful, uh, pushing people to, to, to look at issues that we probably have accepted as generally accepted truths are not necessarily so true today. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, if, if you're listening and, and these ideas resonate with you, check out the book. If you're listening and actually you're pushing back, check out the book even more. Let me make a bigger <laughs> case to you. Because as you, as you said, there's a whole lot more in there about the ways that we need to change work because the way we work now is not working. Best place to send people. The book will be on Amazon and all those fun places. Best website to send people. Uh, DavidBurkus.com. I'm actually uh, really fortunate. Even if you spell that wrong in, in Mr. Google, we'll take you to the right site. DavidBurkus.com is the best place. There's also a ton of free resources and things like that on the site about the new book. So even if you don't buy it, you want to learn a little bit more about it. There's a ton of stuff from interviews to discussion guides, all sorts of stuff on DavidBurkus.com. Well, at some point in time when Mr. Google can read and understand our conversation, they probably do already. I'm sure they will, they will thank you for your reverence to the to the good Mr. Google. So. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's it, it's coming. We'll you know we'll we'll all be bowing before the altar of Mr. Google eventually. Hey, I'll, right? I'll, I'll tell you one that you probably face more than me, but I've faced it a little bit too. Is I was sitting at a Starbucks today, and I'm really not going to like the 
the time when people say, hey, that person looks interesting, or hey, that girl's kind of cute, and you take a picture, and you look at your phone, and they tell you who it is. And I, I, I that has to be less than a year away. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. I mean, I, in, in some cases, we're already there. If you Facebook, have you, have you noticed this? You can post a photo on Facebook, and it'll already try and tag it for you with the faces it recognizes. So, yes. yeah, we're getting there. Fun stuff. David, I appreciate it. Take care. Oh, take care. Thank you so much. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.